but that's that's always good. We're glad we're glad you were able to make it today. Any other observations for the week? The weekend. How was your weekend? Oh, my weekend was exceptional. Right? Exceptional. I got a bit of quite a bit of reading done. I played some golf. I uh, spent some time with the family, did some work. At so I got a good balance, a good balance posture for the weekend and the holidays. So wasn't quite well rested, but I would like to get some rest in due course. I'm sure that everybody's excited to be here today. We got quite a bit of ground to cover, uh, but thank you for asking. My weekend was wonderful. Very good. How's that? Did you did everybody set up the WhatsApp group? I think it's safe to say that. But yes. our, our great administrator, Mr. Darcy, should to should, should be able to tell you better than any one of us could. Mr. Darcy. Let's see him. Mr. Darcy, are you present and accounted for? Hi, good evening, Jermaine. Good evening, everybody. Yes, I am here present. Yes, I did set up the um, WhatsApp group and um, I had quite a number of persons to join. So those who haven't joined, I did send the email as well. So I'll be happy to add as persons reach out to me. And my weekend, I don't know if you're asking me now, but I'll share anyway. Um, it was good. I spent it with my kids and I'm ready for the weekend again. Thank you. Uh, if anything topical from the WhatsApp group, let's give a let's give a, a 10, 15 minute overview of the WhatsApp coverage. Any particular highlights of note? Yeah, Darcy is keeping us quite up to date. Uh, so, quite up to date uh, and in alignment with with our CIRM requirements. So Darcy, you got the you got the floor again. Uh, what are the topics of discussion? Sorry, Mr. I'm actually in commute. Um, I'll repeat that again, please. So what's Sorry. Group? What are the topics of discussions in the Woodcraft group at this time? Oh, so it's, um, I think the last thing uh, somebody dropped a uh, um a article in the group. I can't, oh, one second. I can throw you a helpline, Darcy, while you um, try. Who's that, Jessica? This, uh, yeah, it's me. How you doing? Yeah, 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 yeah so, um, yes, um, I do it, it's Candace, she dropped uh, the PayPal, uh, yeah. the PayPal story, um, PayPal letting users send crypto to friends um, and allowing persons to transfer assets to other wallets. Um, and uh, I guess um, one of the points when I was reading it was um, regarding the, the, the conversation we was had, having earlier last class um, about the crypto and the crypto space. I think Jessica, that's your role. Well, I wasn't gonna comment on that one, but um, I was going to comment and, and I'll, 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 add to, I'll add to that, but I had dropped an article um, on national risk assessments and um, the World Bank, and it was it was a very short article. I think it was maybe a two three minute read um, with the World Bank with some kind of talking about the money laundering risk and um, the risks that, is, that are associated with these national risk assessments that countries are doing. And essentially, um, you know, they were saying the whole essence of the article was there is no there is no standardized or, or standardized approach to national risk assessments and that in itself presents a risk and so i found that very interesting i shared with my colleagues um to for their for their readings and you know for any, any points of views that can be shared on that for country risk assessments that is yes that's that's excellent so it appears that we had two matters of discussion in the whatsapp group and the first one is very intriguing uh, because it relates to PayPal. PayPal is a household name. It's a, it 
it's a definitely a, a platform that is utilized all across the world. Um, online shopping, uh, I believe it's it's become a common medium of business and exchange across countries, across currencies. And what's particularly interesting so far from what you've shared is that there is a level of innovation that certainly touched on the digital asset space. And I'd like for us to talk about it briefly. Um, what sort of thoughts were engaged relative to the PayPal article? Guys, this is your WhatsApp group. Well, I, I read, good afternoon to all, good afternoon to all. I read the, the article and for the most part, I really do not understand that crypto um, uh, currency because I feel that if I had, I would have invested in it some time ago. So I really would like to understand what the crypto currency is all about. So my question isn't really about cryptocurrency, it's more about digital assets. You know, we have a synonymous asset, a homogeneous one, uh, which is our sand dollar. So it's really the bohemian currency in a digital format, right? Which could convert to fiat, but you could consider it as fiat because it's actually a legitimized, legislated, um, properly regulated currency used in our current commerce environment. So my question is about the digital asset space and what type of perhaps risk that we see existing currently and what is emerging. Because PayPal, as I indicated, is a global payments uh, facilitation uh, platform uh, and it's used all across the world, across different merchants. PayPal has subscriptions well into the thousands. I know that you can utilize PayPal to purchase uh, airline tickets for those who would have traveled during the weekend and holidays. Uh, shopping online, that's your eBay, Amazon. Um, we're seeing a lot of things happening with trade, uh, purchases of real estate, uh, conversion currencies, cross countries. So let's talk about it. What are some of the risks? Does, is PayPal even accepted in the within the current commercial banking environment in the Bahamas? So let's, let's see if we can marry the PayPal platform to our operating landscape. I see it as, good evening, everybody. I see it as increasing the risks from a con compliance aspect because with, with cryptos, the persons who own those um, currencies are really sort of invisible and they can be anywhere in the world. And so when you add that to a PayPal, um, it creates to me a forum whereby persons who are engaged in the underground economy have a very legitimate way of moving funds around. Now, I'm sure PayPal would have done their homework in trying to prevent money laundering and terroristic financing, but I just see it as a very difficult task trying to keep out um, those ill-gotten gains out of the PayPal system. And once you get it within the PayPal system, it's just so much things that you can buy using PayPal. Right. So for me, I think it's a, it's a money laundering. Um, from where I sit, I see it as a money laundering. Um, opportunity for those who are engaged in the underground economy. Okay, that's a good perspective. That's a good perspective. Um, Jessica, Darcy. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, I was going to, and I, and I, and it was very, it's a very interesting perspective Donald shared, and I just recently, I mean, recently, I mean, as, as recently as today, I wanted to um, just keep an eye on the PayPal. I had to, I just got a PayPal debit card, um, shipped to the Bahamas, and I had to activate it. And for me to activate it, I had to update my KYC, right? And I, well, I found it very tedious. an EKYC platform. Well, I, yeah. So prior, I don't remember. I don't recall. I've had a PayPal account for years. I don't recall updating any uh, my personal KYC information at all. But right. now I don't know if it's because I got this card that they now want either to upload a passport, a national ID, um, or a government issued ID, and they had to have, they had to accept it. And in addition to that, I had to actually update and had to provide proof of my proof of address in my name. And so I found that very interesting. I don't know if it's because the digital, the emergence of the digital assets on their platform now, um, but I thought it was a very, I thought it was a very um, good initiative uh, from them. I thought it's a great way for them to mitigate risk. I, I think that all digital assets, I think that all financial institutions has some, um, is, has some risk to money laundering, terrorist financing, et cetera, right? Um, I just think it's a way to mitigate those risks. And, I, and in this instance with PayPal specifically, um, their way of eliminating or reducing those risks or mitigating those risks is to know who their clients are. Um, it's, it's very basic, but compared to what PayPal was to what it is now, again, it may be because of the emergence of the new digital asset space that they're trying now to, and, and, and the space is now getting into the regulated environment, you know, it could be a number of things, a factors that can be, that's pushing these platforms um, in addition to the likes of FTX into that um, um, regulated space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so for, um, so like Jessica said, I, what PayPal is doing, I didn't read where they um, came out and made a statement to say, you know, why they're actually requiring it. But we all, I do know that they're saying that it is just to make PayPal um, a bit more safer. And we could we could um, assume that it is because of them now expanding and using this digital, you know, the currencies. But we all, people use PayPal and it is really just for the purposes of a secure means of payment. So people feel safer when they are buying goods and services from people that they don't know cross-border using PayPal because okay, PayPal is supposed to be the safe medium for me to pay my monies are safe until I get what I'm supposed to get um, from, from you. And so that, that's just the reason, that, that's just it. Right, 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 excellent. These are very good points. So I was, I was um, curious about, uh, I know one of the overriding risks um, um, with the cryptocurrencies is it, is in its volatility and um, pinpointing what its value should be at any point in time. So I was curious as to how um, that particular element of it would be managed if um, cryptocurrencies were to be accepted um, for payment. Um, and as known that PayPal would have accepted um, their usual currencies, so forth and so on, and use their methods of conversions. I was curious as to um, what position that would leave them in should the value of the cryptocurrencies that they accept and change at every, any given point in time versus to the other mediums of value that they um, deal in. Yeah, so one of the things that you will find as a part of market risk is that you have to hedge on your financial instruments to support risk transfer liability and then of course volatility as you mentioned so where there is so value proposition should trump volume or volatility uh, where there are so you have open-ended exchanges and you have closed-ended exchanges and wherever you have that that commerce environment or commerce architecture, um, that will be very likely the rules that they play in. 
uh, it's definitely a high a high risk environment. And so the understanding is that you go into that environment knowing that you could very well lose, right? Mr. Uh, Lawrence, if I could just add right there, PayPal did say that you, the user, accept all risks for the currencies in which you hold in your wallet. So whether it be your fiat or your crypto, you are responsible. So PayPal isn't accepting any risk for any kind of liabilities as it relates to your currencies that you own. Right. So you will actually have, so thanks, Candice, you'll actually have exemption clauses like those as a part of the various trading platforms and even these, these exchanges um, like your PayPal, you got Google Pay, Apple Pay. Um, you have so many mediums of exchanges that, you know, you really have to pay attention to the fine print. Um, and so it's important there. It, it's critically important that you, you take note of the integrated regulation right, that they employ. So you're talking about anti-money laundering or money laundering in general, regulations across countries, international standards, right, Basel standards, and they, they incorporate an additional ceiling approach towards mitigating the risk of exposure, whether it be to their institution, or even to their overall stakeholders, particularly those merchants that subscribe with these types of uh, payment mediums. So you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of exemption clauses like that. And today, a lot of the general terms and conditions across different financial institutions, you'll see that that's the way of business today in terms of being able to clearly document comprehensively what some potential risks are and have been experienced by various customers year over year, what's emerging. We know there's a lot happening in the cybersecurity space. So when you think about EKYC, so uh, you think about uploading your passport, NIB, other sensitive documentation, yes, however, um, with contactless approaches, there are now fraudulent schemes that can create synthetic ideas to open accounts, uh, create loans, uh, make various payments, open credit card and other credit facilities um, where you'll be making payments across the globe and you're at home or at work, um, you're completely unaware, right? Um, you're actually getting a depreciation in your credit score um, completely unaware. And so some of my discussions with the Kurf Credit Bureau is uh, ensuring that they maintain uh, an effective ongoing quality assurance process relative to their, relative to the, the completeness of their environment for all of the customers and the financial institutions because there's upload of information. So they're using the, all of the, the, the fields or required fields, they're properly configured to, to the centralized database and that database is, start, is stored in the cloud environment. And so when you think about uh, the impact of a hurricane, uh, the impact of any major disruption to our environment, our data is stored, so our PII, so personally identifiable information, and other sensitive financial information is stored and centralized with uh, this major global company. Now, if you really look at some of the agreements with Griff, and I'm just talking about Griff, for example, uh, you will see even within the clauses, uh, there's a certain degree of indemnity in risk transfer that's placed both on the individual and institution. Uh, before I continue, did somebody have a question? Oh, that was me. Uh, but I think you were going on to explain it. But but I, what I was I was thinking about is um, the matter of globalization um, right. and, and integration. Um, who would be responsible from an international perspective for the governance in that uh, global space? Um, I used to um, uh, be employed 
with one of the um, digital payments companies over here. And I remember the central bank, um, before we could have gone live, they did an extensive test, uh, the, uh, the IT tests and the security risk tests, cybersecurity risk tests and all of that. Yeah. Um, now I read the back to the PayPal article and uh, they spoke about accepting payments and transfer transfers from wallets. So um, uh, I was curious about the criteria of these wallets and who is going to be testing these wallets and who is going to ensure from a global perspective um, uh, the govern, govern that space as the central bank would be doing in our local space. But we're talking about global integrations now and, and introducing a, a, a global perspective in terms of the cybersecurity. Yeah, so there are, there are global companies and regulatory agencies that, that all come together between between OECD, between FinCEN, and and several others, right? Because it's not just one, it's not just one regulatory body. Uh, because you have to look at country concentration or impact, uh, significance of exposure, significant uh, typology of product. So there is a huge conversation that happens at G7 and G20 level, and then they determine what is the next or what is the best course of action um, and so hence you have almost these informal types of uh, financial wars for lack of a better word uh, to ensure that there is a safe haven of commerce uh, across countries right um, so so these are the type of things that is of critical importance as a risk manager. Um, it's good that you, you have in view some of the things that are happening currently, PayPal and no, as I indicated earlier, it is in fact accepted here in the Bahamas. We, we do receive deposits, we can make payments. It's accepted to my understanding and best of my recollection, all of the DCIVs or commercial banks are not too sure about the credit union. But PayPal is here and the competitive landscape, interestingly, has a very flattened yield curve. Um, so with the level of playing field uh, almost being sort of a smoothing out, right? With this sort of quantitative smoothing with the scale of competition, it's going to be interesting in terms of what the market brings uh, for relative to innovation and really the cost element for us to engage in the purchase of products and services. So we see much of the discussion evolving around inflation and what that's doing. Uh, we're feeling it at the pump. We're feeling it. Uh, much of some of the goods really though are, are inelastic um, to those in the middle class and, and upper middle class. Uh, but the lower class, uh, there's been a lot of concerns. We see some of the macro and microeconomic indicators relative to unemployment. Um, we see the rise in crime going up. So the management of the country is, is coming into, into some degree of peril uh, where decisions need to be made in, in very short order. So we have sovereign risk uh, in addition to the credit risk concern. Uh, we see that the the government uh, or the central bank rather facilitated through the Ministry of Finance, they are issuing um, large numbers of BRS and T-bills and opening degrees of participation across customer typologies. Once it was just institutional and it's now individual. Uh, we also saw, I think in our markets recently, uh, for those that have an opportunity to have a quick peek at it, uh, we saw some moderate volumes. We talked about volatility, so there was moderate volumes. Um, literally today, there was, there was absolutely nothing, although there was some movement in some areas. So what is that saying to us? What is that really saying to us? We have the, we have the World Bank today lowering the economic growth projections. We see uh, a plummeting impact with our stock exchange. Uh, we know what's happening with global growth. Uh, the 
emerging threat of stagflation, um, borderline recession. Um, so what are we talking about? What should be on the mind of the risk management professional today? A uh, point I wanted to add as well was the, the fact that um, cryptocurrencies are not yet regulated. Um, I thought that that was a risk factor to be considered um, because it's because of the difficulty in getting it regulated. That's why it has not been regulated across most jurisdictions yet. I don't think it's regulated in any jurisdiction. No, I think it's in one jurisdiction I saw. Um, so I was thinking of that perspective and what implications that would have for the functioning of what PayPal is offering. So cryptocurrencies are regulated across um, several countries in Europe, the US, and the Caribbean. Um, you'll find that there's a lot of leverage with uh, FinCEN, uh, as I mentioned. And in fact, individuals who um, individuals who hold large stakes of uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, some of the larger um, crypto or cryptocurrency tokens or the tokens themselves or the currencies themselves, uh, BNP, um, you see a lot of movement in Decentraland and Sandbox. So, uh, so different countries across US, Canada, UK, uh, the European Union, uh, like the UK haven't done anything. I don't even want to get there with Boris Johnson. He had some real issues most recently. Uh, but you're saying movement, right? He passed the confidence road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, when you when you when you have the dive, when you have to do a Shawnee dive at the political level, you have to think about your history, right? Like what you what really your history, how you got there, which is really, you know, uh, and then and then what is what is the future projection and, and what does that mean in terms of monitoring the country? So uh, for me, I, I just think just just being a, a pragmatist, um, I think it's going to be very short lived for him. So, but but remaining on point, you, you 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 have few countries and a lot of stakeholders with the cryptocurrencies. They are crying out for the regulation because they want to be able to benefit from the levels of returns already experienced for for really holding it to by its viability. So we know in the in the tangible or fiat market space, we talk about hold to maturity. So in the cryptocurrency space with where there's a degree of high volatility, we even have it in, in the in the regular financial markets. So it's it's hold to viability, right? I, I'm able to hold this to the point where it is it provides a degree of value for me. Um, or a high level of ROI for my initial point of investment, right? So uh, somebody had a question? No, I was actually going to make a comment okay. um, about that because, you know, in my, in my crypto portfolio, um, you know, as, as things happen, my money is doing what it's supposed to do. However, it's not like in my bank account where I deposit $300 and tomorrow I have 282. So um, I, have a, <laughs> I have a personal issue. I have a personal <laughs> issue that in my crypto wallet, my money is just growing, but in my fiat bank account, I mean, I, I, I know I supposed to have $300, but when I put it into the bank, it decreases in value. So mm. I have a personal issue there, but that's for a different it's for a different conversation. I just thought I'd say that. Yeah, well, you know, Darcy mentioned the volatility. So the risk is always there inherently for that, for that particular product. Uh, so, so can but you, uh, how, do you, how do you escape that when it's tied to speculation? How do you escape the risk of volatility that's tied to speculation? 
so it's inescapable. So it's it's one of those things that it's those type of financial instruments that is really absolute risk. Uh, there's a high degree of uncertainty, high degree of potential loss, um, not only of interest, but also principal value. Uh, and so you will always be made aware when in the trading space, particularly if, if you're not engaged with these stable coins, um, and, and we can go into a little depth in relation to that. Um, if you're not dealing with the stable coins, then, and, and the only way a coin will be stable is if it is sufficiently backed by fiat currency, right? So you either have gold, silver, platinum, commodity backing that has real dollarized value, or you have the dollar of a country or currency backing that. So you have the Euro stable coin, you have the Tether or USD stable coin, there's the CAD stable coin, there's, right, there's, there's quite a few of them, right? But when you are dabbling into the, the more, the altcoins, uh, so, or the major coins like your Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, that's when you're really subject to that. So it's about timing. It's also understanding some of the projects and purpose. So you have, you know, proof of work, proof of stake. There's different consensus mediums that are utilized with the different different tokens. And so believe me, it's important. And I and I like the fact that it's a talk discussion because the discussion supports open source banking. Go ahead, Dimitri. Hi. Do you have a question? Okay, it's probably in the area. I, I yeah. was gonna I'm go gonna, ahead, Jess. I was gonna add um to what you said. Um, with the with the um, stable coins having that um, fiat backing or that 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 having that backing, um, the U.S. I read on LinkedIn today, I think an article that the U.S. Department of Financial Services, I believe, is um, is enacting some kind of regulations to 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 kind of position themselves as the crypto leaders on this side of the world. And so, I mean, um, it, it hasn't been released yet. I saw three three um, points. I think one was redeemability. Um, I, I really wish I could have found an article just to, to, to cover the three points, but one was definitely redeemability, um, but it's going to be regulated on this side. And that's where the U.S. is trying to position themselves. And I really think it's because um, a lot of countries are are diving into the digital asset space and is positioning themselves to be that next, I guess, um, big financial center in, in this new space. So in light of that, what should be on the minds of the risk management professionals today? What do we believe should be in the minds as we carry out our day-to-day -day functional responsibility. What should be on our minds? Um, this this may sound very um, basic, I guess, but I think first and foremost, we have to educate ourselves um, to be able to handle, to understand the risk in order for us to mitigate them. Um, it's a new space, um, you know, we're up and coming risk managers, um, and I think it's going to touch all of us. Candice, she mentioned she has her investment portfolio. I have an investment portfolio and it's, it's, it was only for your personal, your personal, um, benefit and being able to mitigate the risk from a personal standpoint, um, education is key. And if you're going to be a risk manager in this space, we have to educate ourselves. I mean, that sounds quite basic, but I think that's where we, where we have to start from. 
I think that's fundamental, Jessica, and I definitely support that. Yes, um, I'm, uh, I agree with that. We must educate ourselves, but we must also look for the opportunities that will be presented for uh, us as a country or as behemoths to uh, benefit from this new entity. Uh, that is my uh, point on that. We must look, as a risk manager, we must look for the opportunities that will present for us to get um, uh, to, you know, feel the resources from it. So I like what Orlando said, you know, you have, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to risk and an opportunity, but I think, um, but for me, I would be more focused on the ability to kind of predict and control the losses maybe as in the space. So I would be, you know, thinking about, okay, great, this is happening, but how do futuristically predict, you know, and control any kind of losses possible? So predictive and sensitivity analysis to sort of, sort of maybe extrapolate how to manage risk of loss is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And I and I think that's that's a very prudent, that's a very prudent approach. I like the points on education. I like the point that Orlando mentioned on value proposition. And then the point you raise on understanding how to hedge risk transfer and overall mitigate loss. So just on those three elements. We know that there is or should be in the minds of a risk professional that innovation is the precipice of our discipline. Risk management is a measure of uncertainty. And so where we add that value, it's conditioning our minds, approaches to address the unknown. So a lot of the data analytics and business intelligence approaches must do those very same three core components. And they're absolutely fundamental. I need to educate myself. Um, I need to understand risk appetite, risk tolerances. I need to understand if my business, the culture that I'm in, the people that I serve. And when I say people that I serve, I'm referring to the target market or your customer segmentation, how it's broken down. Are they risk acceptant? Are they risk neutral? Or are they risk averse? If they're risk averse, they don't want to accept any degree of risk. They want safe, secure, they want like a fixed deposit. So for them, you perhaps may want to consider your education and awareness from the view of stable coins and how that can support their interests or align with their interests. Um, you may also want to consider some hedging approaches or risk transfer, giving them an appreciation that you can experience losses, but very marginal in the short run, long run, clearly uh, every dollar adds up. And so there's going to be a life cycle or timing of which they need to enter the market and withdraw from the market. So a prudent risk manager would want to design investment portfolios for their companies, uh, design financial advisory approaches. Definitely there is the compliance element but there's more importantly, the bridge of effective communications through legal advertising, uh, ensuring that you have all of the indemnities, the exemption clauses, there's clarity of what to do 
with restoration and recovery efforts, your asset and liability management approaches? What are some of your financial ratios that will be important to establish three triggers and thresholds? So you can create your own quantitative easing or tapering of the risk as interest rates, currency risk, price risk fluctuates. So, so you have volatility and then you have propinquity of risk. And you have propensity of risk. The reality is the risk will move in the direction of the nature or architecture of the financial instrument. So the risk manager has a, a very, very critical role in not just understanding commerce, how goods and services exchange between individuals and companies, but also how to preserve capital, how to utilize the Basel foundations to support a sound operating environment and sound control operating environment. Darcy, you had a question? No, no, I just um, found it interesting when you spoke about the, the, the capital and we're talking about risk management and we spoke about losses um, associated with cryptocurrencies all that. I remember reading an article from, I think Thomas Rudus, um, talking about the global regulators um, with regard to traditional banks, setting uh, the rule that um, the capital requirements for those banks holding crypto assets would be the entire value of their crypto portfolio. That in itself was um, driving up the cost for those banks and, I, and it's one of the uh, maybe one of the indicators or reasons uh, those banks would be not willing to even deal um, in crypto. Absolutely, right? What I would encourage you to do as risk managers in the discipline, I would encourage you to read the various multinational financial institutions, their letter to the shareholders. Um, some of you may be familiar with JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, uh, HSBC, uh, and, the, and the like. Take a look at those letters to the shareholders, right? I like to follow Jamie Dimon just because of the significance that he has from an impact in the US and even globally. Uh, he talks about how risk, uh, the soundness of operations, people, systems, processes, culture, environment, uh, political concerns, uh, navigating that, shareholder concerns, and it's really the viewpoint of how do we balance the level of return with the uncertainty of innovation. And that's why I thought it was very important. And I can almost applaud you all for raising the point on PayPal. And then the secondary point which was relative to the national risk assessment. The critical point that I would like to raise relative, in terms of the national risk assessment is that there's no one size fit all. So hence, when I spoke last class about setting up your WhatsApp group and networking and really leveraging you are you are building on the core foundations of risk management because in the space that we are in, so I manage enterprise risk here at Commonwealth Bank, there's no policy, there's no procedure. 
you you build like in the common law approaches from the judiciary perspective, you build precedents. You build precedents on approaches that you should take should you were to see or observe the same type of risk, but there is an inherent evolution to risk. And so it's important that you remain on the cutting edge of every discussion um, that is being had relevant in your space because risk is everywhere. So how do you manage this? There, there are risk registers and there are self-assessment reports, there are SOC reports, and there are ongoing discussions that you need to filter through what is important. So let's take the definition further. Risk management is a measure of uncertainty in context of what is important. You follow in the risks that are important to you. So you have an assignment. And the assignment, one of the first things it says, what are the main components of management priority? And what are the risks that are involved? So you as the risk professional, having had sight of the case, need to pull out the risks that are important to you. If you were the CRO in this environment, what would be important to you? What would be important? And when I say you, I'm talking about from in view of the business and the environment in which it operates. So we will, we will get to that shortly. But before we continue, uh, are there any questions so far? Any general observations? Well, a question from me. I didn't quite understand the end of what you said when you referred to reading the various multinational institutions. I didn't get the rest of the statement. Towards the end of your sentences, sometimes your voice drops. So I'm not too familiar with the accent yet. So that's the letter to the shareholders. Okay, thanks. Right, so J.P. Morgan um, has a very good one that I would encourage everybody to follow. So that's the letter to the shareholders. And you'll find out what a lot of the companies in the U.S. and in the European Union, uh, they give some very good perspective, like the report on the Rio Tinto case study. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or observations? All right, all right. So I see everybody is ready to go. So let's try a couple multiple choice questions. All right. Question one. A business model is a set of assumptions about the blank. A, financial stability of an organization. B, organizational structure of a business. C, products and services past performance. Or D, way an organization creates value. I will give you Mr. Williams, sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, my apologies. I thought I was sharing my screen. So let me do that. Share screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Oh, I see we have six names in the chat. Uh, sorry, guys, I missed the chat points. All right, Candace made a point here. Uh, okay. All right. We're good to go. So, question one A business model is a set of assumptions about the blank. You have exactly. About the, I would say, 
You want us to yes. answer in the group, in the, in the chat? No, no, you can just give me the answer. What's your answer and why? Is it the sustainability of an organization? The financial sustainability of an organization? Are you asking the question or are you giving me the answer? <laughs> no, I was given the answer. <laughs> I would say D. I would say B. What is it, D or B? D, way an organization creates value. What is the reason why? Pardon? So what is your answer and your rationale or your reason why you chose that answer? Oh, okay. Um, well, the business model, in, from my understanding, the business model um, assumes various uh, um, aspects of the business that need to be addressed towards the creation of value. Um, the aspects of the business, such as um, how are they going to deliver that um, deliver their service or deliver the value that they'd like to create. Um, the, what else should I say? Um, how it's going to operate and from a, a social standpoint. I'm just thinking out loud. I wasn't expecting that question. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also go with D. <laughs> that I, I can't I can't really pinpoint why I would say D, but it, that, that's just what the business is. It creates and delivers value. That that's what they do. And I would add to that with the, with the answer for B, B and D is a combination of A, B, C, which equates to the value um, of the organization. So all of those things kind of contributes to the value. Is this a so trick question? Because this has to be a trick question. This cannot be a multiple choice question on the exam because it, you know, a business model is a business model. People choose their business model all the time. So why are they choosing it for whatever reason? So if this is a trick question, then Jessica says she's gonna go with A, B, and C. So we should add all of the above because when you think about it, you may start to think deep and come up with all of these different reasons. So Hopefully you only- so this is a question on the exam. <laughs> um, you're absolutely correct. It would be A through C. Otherwise, you would choose D. Oh. And, and you would choose D for the reasons earlier expressed on how an organization or why an organization create value. But let's break this question down. So, Mr. Way, I'm sorry. Before you, before you do that, just out of curiosity, but out of the technical explanations, okay. this is a question that did not say choose either or. If we were in the exam, we would select D. It didn't say, it only has one line. So I don't know if they're trying to, if this is a complete sentence or whatever, but I, I, I'm thinking that we would just select D. So could you... Um, could you please clarify what is the correct answer? And then we can get into kind of understanding your explanation of why that is the correct answer. So the answer is D because as, as I earlier alluded to your value creation, the reason why you establish a company is because you want to create a level of return for yourself as a shareholder or the stakeholders. And as a part of the value proposition, it is about solving a problem, improving quality of life, but really you are addressing a need. And so the key to this question lies really in what it's asking you. It's about any fundamental business model, any fundamental business model. So what is a model? It's a methodology of approach that you will conduct in your business. 
how will you address your target market? How will you address the supply chain needs? How will you ensure proper management of your resources? How will you hedge? How will you support oversight, compliance, risk? What is your model? What is your framework, right? And your framework supports financial stability. That's a key assumption. It doesn't support the organizational structure. What in the design, in the implementation of your methodology, you need a sound organizational structure so that you can provide clarity of functional roles and responsibilities. your products and services past performance. So a measure of uncertainty. We know our historical performance, but historical performance is not necessarily, necessarily an indicator of future performance. But it's a good point of assumption. But what is key is, so out of a risk weight, each of them would hold roughly about 20% but D would have the greatest weighting, about 80, 90%. Because the primary assumption is that you're gonna create value and you're gonna create value which supports financial stability, which supports soundness of structure, which supports optimized performance of your products and services, whether it's cost to serve, your market scale, customer utility, and overall ROI. Yes? Any yes. questions? Everybody's good? Yes. Yes, bro broken on, broken yes. on, clearly. So I have another question for you. What would this question look like if the answer was A? And I'm just taking a guess here. Would it be a credit risk model, perhaps? It speaks to my finances. Perhaps. Anybody want to um, give it a try? Uh, maybe. Who, who, I mean, I guess I, I'm trying to figure out a way to talk about the shareholders. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to find a way to talk about shareholders um, in here. So I'm trying to think of a corporate governance question, but I, I can't, can't make it out just yet. No, but that's good though, because financial stability is a fundamental of corporate governance and shareholders' interests. So your question could just be very well, what is the definition of financial stability? So it could be, what is the core expectation from a corporate governance and shareholder interest perspective? That's a good question. <laughs> yes. That's a good question. What would be the question if it was B? Guys, this is not a trick. So what is an organizational structure? I mean, it's about oh. those corporate governance, right? Same thing, it's about- yeah. It's about the uh, corporate, corporate governance, the board of directors, the um, uh, uh, leader of the, uh, the management staff of the organization, and right on that line, and the functional areas, I guess. So a question could be, what is the 
oh, I guess we could say corporate governance, um, or we could list some areas. <laughs> we may be able to list some areas like oh. um, financial, business planning, um, business development. You know what the problem is? Here's what the problem is. <laughs> Here's what the problem is. What the problem is, is that you guys are too certified. Right? Everybody is certified with so many years of experience. And you're not breaking it down. You know what they say when you can't break something down, right? That means you, you know don't know, you don't know it at all. You don't know it at all. Okay, so. Let me give it a chance. Long day. So wait, 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 before we continue, what I want you to do, what I want everybody to do is just relax, right? This is not a trick. Okay, Guys. so you have, you oh, have wait, 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 one second, one second, one second. Relax, because what is gonna happen, right? This is a simulation of what you will experience during the exam. We've all, undertaking exams, some maybe not so long ago, others, they haven't done exams in years. So one of the things that you wanna do, remember, you are a risk professional. So you don't see things the way everyone else will see it. Anything that is presented to you, you should be able to align your fundamentals and bring context to it. And it's about your audience from the very basic to the highly technical. So let's give it a stab again. Okay, I would say start with your board of directors. You have your chief executive officer, your president, and you have your VP of financial services, your VP of uh, risk management, uh, and uh, then you have your management of the line staff, and then we move on down the line, down the line to the various departments and same areas. So you are absolutely correct. Yeah, I was about to say I will support Orlando, like. When I see all of those persons, I know, I know what that means. This is the organizational structure. So what would the question be now, guys? That is the question. We list all of those people and uh -huh. then you, we list all of them and said, these are, that's it. That's the question with the blank, just like how you have it right here. Great. Because we don't want to be, we don't want to use our certifications to miss the point when it's a basic thing. So. You know, you just told us that we highly certify, which we all thank you for that. But we also don't want to be, you know, we don't want to over-interpret the question. Right. So, you, you, you know, it's, it's kind of challenging, like, right now, like, because you're risk managers, we're thinking about it with a risk perspective. And so when we look at this, it's almost like all of us could have a different answer for, you know, this, this one question. Yeah, absolutely right. You have to help us to, you know, bring it into the context of the expectation of, of, of the, of the, of the program. So let's transition to question two. What two analytical tools are particularly useful in analyzing the business model? Now, I hope we didn't get disconnected because it's turning up now. Um, you have to give us some time. You have two minutes for the question. You have 30 <laughs> seconds. You, you, <laughs> you have 30 seconds. I'd say B, the curious indicators and gap analysis. Two analytical tools. I would say are useful in analyzing the business model? Oh boy, that's a good question. So I, I would say A, because I'm thinking about, um, uh, I'm not sure. This is a really tricky question. 
Because again, it all depends on how I interpret it and what I think or what I would use. Um, hmm. I really say A or B. So I would say, and, and considering question one, the answer we chose yeah. to question one, and using the process of elimination and common sense, mm -hmm. um, I would probably go with D because if my the business model, the set of assumptions about, and the most plausible answer here is a way an organization creates value, then in analyzing that business model, I would think we would choose a value chain analysis and some benchmarking before we get into the performance. I mean, performance and risk will definitely be a part of that, I think. So that's my reason I, I would say D, I don't know. I would, yeah, I would say D too. Um, because of the creation of value to see where where it's being created through well just the first part anyways value chain analysis i have a question what is value chain analysis that everyone is accepting as the answer Did we get disconnected? Uh, um, I, I, without, and I don't know the definition of value chain analysis, but I would think it's something where you, where the value in a business is being analyzed, where, you know, where the value is in the company. Um, Okay, yes. the output yes. it's activities I, business use to find out or you know find out about their product value. I, I would choose I'll help Jessica. Emma, I'll I'll choose the answer I, B. I, I, I think indicators mean, and the gap analysis. Right. That's what I would choose. B. Key okay. risk indicators. So right now um, we right now we have on the table a discussion on what is value chain analysis. We're gonna come back to that a lot. Okay. So I think right. someone else was talking. It was it was it um Donald? No, no, it was Dimitri. I, I think Dimitri. it's everything that they said. And I, I think they also it's also used to um kind of analyze the activities to see if there's a way to either to either to like reduce costs or like increase like the differentiation. If I, to be fine, value chain analysis, I would say that I would break down because it's a chain that you're analyzing. So you're analyzing the different parts of that chain. Um, so it's the value along the different segments that form part of the chain. So you're analyzing the value in those different segments. That's what I would say. Thank you, I love it. It's very simple. And it's not a it's not a Google search response. Guys, like let's settle down. Right? Remember, the course will only be as difficult as you make it. Put the words together. Value chain analysis. We're going to find value as we go along. Right? We've been talking about it, value proposition, a measure of uncertainty that matters. So your business model sounds technical, but it's really saying your methodology, your approach. So when I approach understanding the analytical tool, right? Yes, the answer is D. Because yes, because of the very reasons which were shared. Key risk indicators 
gap analysis is also a very practical approach, but Jessica brought it out. If you're analyzing your business model, what you're doing is you're really trying to assess a process of improvement. It's not likely that you're going to have key risk indicators if you're trying to improve the process. Identifying your indicators isn't necessarily your performance result. It's an indicator. It's, it's, it's indicating to you that there could be an upward shift or a downward shift. Now, a gap analysis is relevant because it's really the difference between an expected outcome and the actual results, yes? It's a gap, there's a space. Yes? Yes. Yep, agreed. So one of the things that I want us to walk away from these few set of questions, as professionals, we tend to complicate things more than they need to be. The key words in this question was analyzing the business model. I am undergoing a review of my framework. I'm undergoing, you as the risk manager, you were brought a set of policies. You were brought a methodology, a procedural flow. And they're asking you to challenge the, 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 the process flow. They're asking you for process improvement. They need a critical mind. Gap analysis, yes. But gap analysis stand alone because you're just gonna have indicators. Value chain and benchmarking. So benchmarking isn't benchmarking synonymous to a type of gap analysis. So you have analysis between two different outcomes and you want to leverage learning from either another institution, past performance, successful outcomes, et cetera, right? It's really leverage learning. So then if you transition it to finance, you have leverage ratios, you have gearing ratios. So you could take some of the fundamentals and transition it to support effective decision-making. Yes? Okay, okay. So tell me something. Uh, let's say now you're going into a business, you yes. start a business or you're in a business, you're already in, in a business, but you yeah. are from, a, there is this industry, but you're trying to do something new okay. to uh, bring more profit to your company. So you were saying that benchmarking would have to do when I'm uh, looking at the other company, see what they are producing what are, what are their results or, and so forth benchmarking in that context would be a viability assessment or feasibility assessment because it's at your point of entry or the level of maturation of the business so you are just initiating the process you're looking at getting started so you need to determine if it is viable. Will this work? I look at my scale of competition. I look at how my product either is homogeneous or the same and 
how it can have some distinguishing differentiation for what? Creating value. Because what is the difference between competing companies? Everyone believes that they have the better value proposition. Yes? Yes, we got that quite fine. So, yes, yes. so your benchmarking would be your feasibility or your viability. So I need to understand if this is going to work. And so that allows us to segue into stress testing and reverse stress testing. So stress testing, I want to simulate certain constraints, prohibitions. I want to impact my operations, my, de my decision model, my products and services to see how it will react under certain circumstances. Because I want to design in a forward-looking approach, what type of control mechanism I want to have in place to support resiliency of that product or service. Yes? Reverse stress testing is I have a certain outcome. I have a certain outcome. This is my expected outcome. I want to make a hundred million dollars by December 31st. That's what I want to do. I want to sell 100 units of my product by December 31st. Now, that is my future value expectation. Reverse stress testing is taking a future value expectation and as it says, taking several steps back into the present value to determine what you need to do today to get the expected outcome in the future. So how do I reverse from future value to present value so that I can properly extrapolate the outcome? What do I need to do today? When it's dollarized, it's straightforward. Savings, investments, strategizing, taking a level of risk. You're looking at scale. You're looking at pooling of assets. Straightforward, right? But when you go into riskier assets, then you have to look at hedging. What are my ability? And we talked about it earlier. What is my ability to leverage? What is my ability to mitigate certain risks? I could make a I could make a hundred million. And if we use a calendar, I can make a hundred million by February. But the ebbs and flows of the market throughout the remainder months and quarters, respectively, depreciated the value or caused a corrosive effect, which impacted the final outcome. So it's important. So what am I saying? Companies make money, they see wonderful profits, and then they start paying out wonderful dividends and performance bonuses and everybody's happy. And there doesn't seem to be a contingency mechanism in place for the uncertainty. So Basel one said it was capital. Basel two said, well, 
we need you to look at your ratios, look at how they fluctuate, understand some of the key risk indicators. But the risk professional use value chain. We're not auditors. We don't we don't measure our outcomes on past performance. We literally go forward. We go forward. So let's go to the next one. Risk management professionals conduct supply chain analysis to identify what? Thirty seconds. Okay. Yeah. Answer and why. Why did you say why did you say A? Oh, okay. Um for from a business continuity standpoint, um the risk professional assesses the supply chain to identify where there would be any gaps um, in coverage um, if there is any interruption. So the contingent business interruption coverage basically from my understanding would be to assess where you need to have contingencies when there are interruptions with your supply chain um, when your supply chain is disrupted. Um, right. That's what All I right. Know. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I will um, go with Shanta on that also. Um, again, thinking very, you know, again, too deep, um, thinking about the supply chain uh, from business continuity kind of standpoint I'm thinking of. Um, and, and business interruption and, and coverage and all of that, and the management of that. Um, I think I will go with A, a being the most plausible and most comprehensive to, as it relates to supply chain analysis. I, I too will go with A for the very same reasons, because when you, again, we, we're using words to get the answers now. When we think about supply chain, we're just thinking about being able to give your customers what, you know, offer, continue, again, BCP, continuing your, your business and your offerings. And then we're thinking about interruption. Should there be um, some cause for to not be able to get what? So give your customers what they need. So is supply chain the only thing that we see here? I, I, I'm a, I look at A and I like that oh. answer, but what about D, potential vulnerabilities to the organization? What Where about we that? So Mr. Williams, supply chain is not the only thing um, that we see, but we are conducting a supply chain analysis. So if no, we- No, no, <laughs> Who is conducting the supply chain analysis? Uh, the risk, risk management. The, the risk the management, risk management yeah. Look at the question. Risk management professional. The risk management. Yes, so it's, uh, yes. Coverage is actual. Technology needs is actual. Regulatory requirements is actual. Potential vulnerabilities is future. Right, but when you think of, that, no, that that is, we. I'm sure we all thought about that, all right, because of the word and the associating words together, risk and vulnerabilities. We are doing that, however, we are also thinking about we're also thinking about what we are doing. So I'm not thinking about, you know, what is my function? I'm thinking about what I am doing and why I'm doing it. I like the answer D, the potential vulnerabilities to that's, the organization like. as well. Yeah, that's that's I like, like I like D. I like A, but I love D. So remember, remember, this is why I said take a step back understand who is doing the work. If this had simply said, um, 
first line of defense is conducting a, a supply chain analysis. Um, the insurance agent, right, is conducting a supply chain analysis. If the CEO, anybody but the risk management professional, sure, you can choose A through C. But if it's the risk management professional, we are there to provide advice on how on how to move forward. Remember, we have gone forward. Agreed. So a potential vulnerability in the supply chain of an of a um, let's just say um, a what's the what's the airline again? Not Bahamas, yeah, uh, uh, any one of them. The local, I guess we could say Bahamas. Yeah. Okay. So what is the potential vulnerability to the organization, right? Uh, from a risk um, a risk management professional and a supply chain and, and a supply chain analysis. If, we, if you're choosing D, a potential vulnerability to the organization would be what? To the supply chain? No, no. You're saying that if we're, we're risk management professionals, so let's just say we, we, we are giving you an organization, and I'm saying a Bahamas a low-cost carrier, a Bahamas sale. What would be a potential vulnerability to Bahamas sale? If I'm conducting the supply chain analysis or when I did, what, what, what would I come up with? Well, let's break it down. I love your question, by the way. So we are a risk management group of professionals for the airline industry. Yes, that's what we're saying. Right. And we are there to specialize in understanding the measure of uncertainty on the risks that matter. Yes? Yes. So for an airline, I need to understand my ability or the organization's ability to actually source a plane. But we have planes already. We have, well, we have you didn't, you they're didn't, all working. Okay, we can add more assumptions. To it. <laughs> no, this is not conjecture. It really is, you know, it, it really is a question you you wouldn't think. But again, again, we're playing a on hypo, earth. A, playing hypo, earth. a hypothetical is the basis of conjecture. Okay. Because you, because what we remember now, the fundamentals of what we are doing and believe me i love the question and i'm not and i'm not saying that a could not be an answer i am simply saying that b that d is a better answer from multiple choice you only have one unless it says choose two Okay, so you have uh, you have two persons that would have said, or three persons that would have said A, and then two said D. So then, what does that mean? Is it does that mean it's the type of questions that we're asking, or are you saying we're too certified? Because it, it it really just can't be that we all can't come up with the same answer. I will cap it off to say we are in a process of transitioning because the risk management designation is is not a is not a simple one it's it's complex in nature and this is why you you need a a proper support structure and the networking the networking does that for you aligning with a accredited bodies and organizations globally they give you that they give you that degree of support right um again what you will find is that even your concepts of approach will be challenged because a lot of your governors your executives will not see it from your perspective and so you have to be supported by a lot of data and analytics 
that are not necessarily based on historical information because you remember you have to understand your audience your audience is from an historical basis a past performance basis so give them what they're accustomed to but you have to take that information and extrapolate it into the future depending on that audience you may be able to take it three months you could take it six months, you could take it a year. A lot of professionals don't recognize that they carry out certain fundamentals during their strategic planning or their budgeting. So they forecast how they're gonna spend their monies, how they're going to manage resources, et cetera. But, the, but what they don't understand is that throughout the budgeting and the strategic planning process is an ongoing value chain analysis so that's where the dynamics come in navigating the dynamics so in a previous year because usually this is this discussion happens during the fourth quarter or third or fourth quarter of the year in preparation for the following year there's a whole lot of conjecture about what the future will look like. So the assumptions on timing, feasibility, business impact, likelihood of occurrence, all of those are factored in. But as the variables shift in the positive direction or in an unfavorable direction, that's where you need the risk manager to now be able to provide another yield curve that runs parallel to the expected outcomes to then determine how we need to shift behavior. So again, when you look at your multiple choice, you want to be able to drive home fundamentals. So for this one, the answer is key. So number four. Thirty seconds. Which activity does the risk management professional perform immediately after obtaining internal and external information about the organization. You will analyze the information. Analyze. I think everybody got to get this one right. <laughs> I hope so. Hey. <laughs> All right. Oh, and why you want us to tell you why? Because the role is to provide analysis for decision, to support decision-making. Yeah, because I would think that seeing that he get the, the, he got all this information or she got all this information, the risk management professional got all this information. They must analyze it first before they're able to uh, organize it and uh, report it. That's my take on it. Um, I'm gonna go. I think I gotta go with B. <laughs> I can go with B. I just gonna tell him to go with B, Jermaine. Yeah, I gotta go with B. I gotta read this again. Oh, Mr. Williams. Oh, thanks. so now we're nice. shifting up now. Yeah, you know, because I was ever going with B. I was ever going with B. Because <laughs> I'm thinking from a very basic approach. After I got this internal, or oh, this sorry, the risk management team get this internal, external information. You can analyze until you organize information so you can know Thank you what so things much. or categories. You are so right. You are so right. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? What but this doing? is the thing. You would assume that you have organized information. Why would you no, be no, 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 organized no. information? There's no assumption. The question is clear. It's even bold and black. What does it say? But to me, you have to analyze it to organize it. Uh, okay. You know something? I, I, I can I can truly get that, uh, but again, I think 
I think we have a challenge with these questions because again, you can have, like, we're not just trying to figure this thing out. Like I wouldn't assume, and again, it's almost like, would I just get a bunch of disoriented information? Yes, I'm collecting the information. So I'm naturally assuming that the information is all over the place. So that isn't even gonna come into question. But when I read the questions again, and because now I understand, you know, the, the, the potential questions and the strategies in which I must take to respond to these questions, which I will not practice. <laughs> I will not practice this approach, but for the purpose of this exam, I, I would say B. I, I would change my answer. So you're giving me 30 seconds to, to, to make <laughs> I need to think. <laughs> You're in the normal course of business. You get files, hard copy files, soft copy files. The first thing you want to do is organize them. That's what that's what we have an assistant. I think the assistant would do that, but okay, no problem. We would organize the information first. Yes. And so it's it's critically important that we even understand the risk management quadrant. Identify, how do you identify risk? You would have had to firstly gather information. So you have an assignment. It says identify the risk. So you pull up the report and you are trying to understand it, right? Organize it and analyze it. It's not technical, right? So it's been four questions so far. Organize on the quadrant. So no, no, organize is not on a quadrant. Okay. But you, you want to take you want to take homogeneous approaches. And you, you're gonna find symmetrical and asymmetrical jargon in the discipline. And it's important that you are knowledgeable about different disciplines because you need to understand where people are coming from to support effective decision-making because it doesn't matter who it is or who your audience is, if you cannot reach them, they won't know whatever you're talking about, right? So let's go, 30 seconds. Last one. Which risk identification and analysis technique should a risk management professional use in order to gather information from multiple departments in a brainstorming session that helps to identify shared risk within an organization? Now, Mr. Williams, I'm thinking this could be a trick question because in to the organization where I work, I've had risk managers do a checklist and also did questionnaires to find out information on where it could be any potential risk or risk that is happening now within the organization. So I'm a little confused with that one because okay. you have different risk managers would approach things things differently. I've I've seen checklists, I've seen questionnaires. So to me, it's between one either either or. Um, okay. I'm thinking if if I could remember correctly, the questionnaires worked out pretty 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 well. I cannot remember what was the result of the checklist. Okay. Okay. I would say questionnaires. Okay. So we got checklists, we got questionnaires. What else we got? I, I think the 
to identify shared risks. That part is causing me to look at the question twice or three mm -hmm. times or four times. Okay, I understand. This is a very long 30 seconds, guys. Where's uh, Darcy and Jessica? And where's Miss Where's Miss Roberts? I'm so, I'm still digesting it. I'm still digesting this. Uh, I'm um, digesting. Um, I would, and again, thinking very basic, thinking you know the risk mind. You know, I would. I, I think I was leaning to what workshops, but then I think on the other hand. Because we say brainstorming sessions, right? So yeah, you what kind of things going on up in here? Huh? No, oh, Jessica, you're absolutely right. All kind of stuff going on up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking of, brainstorming, brainstorming sessions. Then you say you know, the brainstorming session which means you gotta be together talking, either if you're on a conference call, yeah. or, but you have a workshop here. So it'll be a workshop then. Then you're saying shared <laughs> risk. I like 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 yeah. where does it stop? <laughs> so on one hand, I'm thinking workshop on the other hand, I was thinking flow chart, but then the brainstorming session kind of pulled me back to workshop. Right. So and then wake shop, wake shop. Wake shop. Because you'll be together and you'll be discussing things with heads of department and you'll be brainstorming. You'll be trying to get answers. No, I think too many things going on up in here because you're saying a risk identification and analysis technique. It would be a question there. Right, because you're trying to gather information. It wouldn't be that would be the first thing if you don't read the rest. Then when you come down to this other part of a brainstorming session, you know you got to be together hashing it out. So yeah. then it would be in a workshop. But then like I, I at what point is it? But don't you need to ask? Don't you need to be asked the questions so you can have something to hash out? Well, yeah, you know, I think the multiple no, departments. You in, in the place where you coming up, you 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 coming up with these things together, and everybody have differences of opinion because again. Risk professionals are not liked people, and so you, you're gonna have you're gonna have a real interesting session. That is why I the 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 shared risk part had me thinking of flowcharts because uh, you're already in a brainstorming <laughs> session. I mean, we are all together, so why circulate a questionnaire when you are in the brainstorming session already? Um, and we're trying to identify shared risks, so um, that's. To me, that's where the flow charts came in um, because I don't see workshop being the answer because we're in a brainstorming session already. Um, I, I mostly a workshop get towards training and those sorts of things. Um, yeah, that one is a very confusing question. I thought if I changed the... <laughs> workshop of this, workshop of this. I, th I thought if I change it up a little bit, it might stand out. So I will share this with you so that it could support your review uh, when it is time. So you'll get this in my next communication to you. Uh, checkpoint 816, how are we looking? Do we need a break? Do we need to continue? Are we good? Yeah, I think I'm good. good. I'm good. Good. I'm, good. I'm liking this. I'm liking this. Okay. Okay. So I will make sure I save this and we will have this information. Remember now, the key, the key to this is you read the question. You already have the answer. More importantly, you want to be able to design your question if the other options were the answer. Mr. Williams, I think that, you know, th this is going to be interesting because you're confusing risk management jargon with basic stuff. And it's like, should I think about this basic or should I think about this? you know, as a risk professional, and you, you wouldn't put those two things, because if you're going to say a tool, when you use those kind of words, a risk identification tool, like, 
some people who work in risk management will actually know we there's some there are certain tools that we use and a workshop we will not consider it a tool it it, it is it could be but we, we we wouldn't say that that is one of them and again we only have certain answers here so you would go with something something that aligns with professionals and risk management it, it would be a questionnaire and not a workshop but okay I just because brain brainstorming sessions are one of the, the number one ways to for risk identification. So if you're already doing the brain in a brainstorming session, um, I'm thinking here, what are we using in within the brainstorming session? I feel like we're in the brainstorming session now. Yeah, we are. <laughs> so if brainstorming session was here then that would be the answer but it's in a question sometimes the most obvious we don't even pay attention to oh, so Lessons learned, don't overthink with your multiple choice. Two, you want to make your best approach at answering the question and you don't want to take any more than 30 seconds to read the question. Yes, you have approximately a minute and a half to roughly two minutes. You want to use most of your time understanding what matters most of each question. In this question, it was multiple departments in a brainstorming session. In this question, it was the use of the word risk professional and the fact that you're getting information internally and externally. So it could suggest that you have a voluminous amount of information. It could suggest that someone's hard copy and soft copy. So you wanna analyze it, right? You wanna organize it. You wanna prioritize it. You wanna report it. You can do all those things, but what should you perform immediately? Immediate. And that's what you wanna do. Yes, supply chain analysis. It is critical for contingent. That word was that word was something. I understand. But when I risk weight the importance of interruption coverage, so maybe some insurance or maybe just supplying a particular product, the weight is higher for the full, this is an enterprise risk management response. So your key word was risk management and supply chain analysis, which suggests enterprise why. So look for the enterprise why answer. We went through this one, value chain analysis and benchmarking. Don't get tripped up. And that's why it's important to understand some of the fundamentals. And of course, we discussed why. So any questions so far before we transition? Any questions, no, no questions. questions? No questions for me. Okay, great. So let's just go through a few here. We talked about the quadrant. Uh, we, we discussed what risk management is really all about. And it's looking at your level of returns when you think about probability or likelihood of occurrence, right? A measure of uncertainty. You go in into types of investment risk. So you need to appreciate 
some of the fundamental risk in these slides. Uh, so I trust you would have read these slides, interest rate risks. Uh, we experienced that a lot. We experienced that with government fixed income securities, our PGRS, our T-bills. Uh, we have an appreciation for what this means from our mortgage portfolio in the Bahamas because that's really where our level of concentration is exposed. Um, not very much from an investment perspective, whether it's a, from our trading platform or the more viable investment, which is the government fixed income securities. Business risk, we talked about this from the point of view of the business really from an enterprise risk perspective. Uh, yes, this goes into the investment side of things, but you wanna look at how do you mitigate unsystemic risk, right? Unsystematic risk, which is really to diversify. Credit risk, we know what that is, that's synonymous to your default risk. Taxability calling inflationary, one of the things that we're already going through right now, which depletes your purchasing power. Liquidity risk. Uh, what we got here. Okay, so liquidity risk. Uh, of course, we you have your financial ratios, your current ratio, your asset test. You want to understand what the regulatory requirements are associated with that. So I'll likely give you some very nice questions relative to that. Systematic risk. This is undiversifiable. This is the inherent risk of uncertainty. Stop me if I'm going too fast, guys. So legislative, social. I think we could fully appreciate that in the 242. Reinvestment risk. We talked about that when we looked at, of course, the cryptocurrencies, PayPal, and other payment exchanges. Then you go into really the fundamentals of where risk management is in place. So second line of defense, governance, control effectiveness. You're gonna have questions on this slide. So I would make a note on this slide. What is the role of the risk manager? What is the, the key fundamental? Who does the risk manager report to, right? That's critical there. And you can see some of the functional roles that are held within the risk management space. Second line of defense, financial control, security, risk management, quality, inspection, compliance. So as you can see, that's a huge responsibility. And you have to likewise provide oversight for first line and ensure effectiveness to support third line, as well as corporate governance reporting. We talked about that earlier. So we went a little bit in the investor life cycle, there are different phases. Uh, accumulation, consolidation, spending gift phase. A lot of you would have already experienced this in your own right and life perspective. Um, so accumulation, your early years, you're building a career, you are working in the environment, an organization, you maybe have some wealth that was passed down to a family, generations, et cetera. Uh, but from really the investor life cycle perspective, it's assuming a, a work cycle. Um, and so really the consolidation phase is when you're at that midpoint of your career, uh, between like your 45 and 55. Um, so you have that spending and consolidation phase. The spending phase really is at the point of retirement, as, as it clearly says here. So we could go into it a little bit more. You're gonna have questions on this particular slide. So life cycle and wealth cycle. 
age group. So this is when we talk about customer typology, what are some of the expectations? These are core components of uh, those customers. So then the slide takes you through the age gaps and what you could expect. So the structure of assets, this is of course where your cryptocurrencies would be speculative. So we talked a little about that. And again, this is where your highest level of returns are. So there's an inverse relationship with safety and stability when it comes to the degree of risk and returns. So you'll have a question on that as well. So that, that information is nice, healthy reading relative to a policy statement. We talked about the risk tolerances, which is the risk seeking, risk neutral, or risk averse. So when you design your policy, your approaches, when you consider risk management decision-making, you want to take these into account because they in fact life cycle, wealth cycle, and ultimate degree of return. Any questions so far? No, we good to go? Yes, no questions for me. All right, so this is a nice healthy diagram, which should give you some context about risk and return. Uh, we talked about the trade-off between risk and expected returns when we looked at value chain dynamics, as well as the benchmarking of feasibility. So this goes into some of the emotional or the human side of it, the psychological and the economic factors. So you have some questions that, that typically I would design relative to this. Uh, just one second for me, guys. Brilliant. All as well. Okay, no problem. Good stuff. All right. So some of these we would are very familiar with. Uh, some we may not necessarily be close to. Uh, but this is where it's trending now. And this is where a lot of the professional skepticism is analyzed. You're looking at the, the cognitive aspects and the behavioral elements of it. So when there was a discussion on the application scorecard and behavioral scorecard, your behavioral hold or held the most weight when it came to credit adjudication, uh, decision-making, relationships, uh, critical factors on how you can measure confidence, how you can support risk-based decisions. So what this is getting into is the mindset. It moves away from the quantitative side of it to the qualitative. What is the mindset of the risk management professional? What are some of the things you have to think about? You, yes, we are certified. Yes, we are exposed from a financial services perspective. But there are certain elements we need to understand about the environment in which we work in, the people, our stakeholders that we serve, and what matters to them. Because in order to measure uncertainty, you have to understand what matters. 
because risk is everywhere. So you're measuring the uncertainty of risk based on what matters. So these are some of the things, in particular, the cognitive bias that you wanna avoid. So we, what we experienced when we were doing the multiple choice questions, our discussions with the questions align with some of the biases that we feel that should be carried out in the normal course of business, whether it was from our own examples or our own experiences, and even some of the, the hypothetical design that we use to support our position. What is critical for a risk management professional is to allow the facts to stand on their own. Because you want to avoid trying to influence. Advisory is not about influence. It's about alignment of interest. Remember the quadrant? Alignment of interest. And that's why you need to appreciate life cycle, wealth cycle, where someone is in their life, whether it's in their personal life or career, and how does it support the risk-based decision that they need today to understand their potential vulnerabilities of the future. So these typically are what we see because there's a, a tendency to lean towards or really to align value proposition with financial performance, market performance. It seems to be positively correlated. And that's why you'll find that disciplines like risk management are individuals that can manage stress very well, that can support contingent events. During an actual material disruption in your business, it's not about risk management anymore. It's about issues management. You pass the information on to your CEO or your COO because it's now an issue. It's no longer a risk. It's a reality. I, it's no longer uncertain. We are in it. So now as they try to navigate moving out of it, the risk manager is supposed to support an understanding of the potential vulnerabilities as you navigate out of it. So don't flow or find yourself in a synapse of supporting everything that is happening around the table. Allow everyone to share their views. Allow the prevailing observations of the current issue. If you put a set of issues on a piece of paper in the boardroom, everybody will look at it and see the same thing. You will have an almost like a domino effect. It just ripples throughout the room. The first person speaks, that becomes the prevailing view, especially if it sounds great. And when you see everyone in the room, they all agree so quickly, you have to ensure that you now challenge the mindset 
to move out of the bias, to move away from the herd behavior, to support the critical decision-making, the what if, have we considered? What do we believe would be the impact of this to that? Have we thought about our value chain dynamics? Do we understand what are some of the additional contingency factors that lie ahead? So what really drives all of this is the attitude, the belief, and the perception. So we talked earlier, risk-seeking, risk-lover, risk-neutral, risk-acceptant, risk-averse. So you have values model, you have mission statements, and then you have tolerances. And that's why it's important when you design or you support the design of policies, procedures, governance frameworks, you either you have the stress test or based on some levels of benchmarking or past performance, you help to stretch the ability for your organization to accept a degree of risk. You always want to move one degree to the right, depending on your own circumstances. Because what you will find is many organizations just want very great returns. Everyone wants to be in the black. Everyone wants to be positive. No one wants to hear the negative message. But in order for you to get the true returns, as we saw in the investment risk pyramid, you have to move in the direction of the risk. You have to chart the cost. I support and encourage FTX, Arwork X, and a few other trading platforms that are building in the digital asset space. I support the innovation that we are making even in the traditional markets because there's an overwhelming degree of evolution that we're going to benefit from. And it's going to create peripheral scale to market, awesome utility across various industries. And it really started with lifting the ceiling of our risk attitude, belief, and perception. That's where it starts. So then, of course, the slide goes into other elements which are very critical to. Uh, the subject matter, we, we talked about these when we looked at Basel I, Basel II, the three pillars, uh, capital appreciation, preservation, uh, total return. So that was a nice reading. Primarizing, that's definitely a, a critical point because the time value of money also runs parallel with the time value of opportunity. But what's important for us is how do we align that with your attitude, beliefs, and perception? So this is where I started to talk about, and then we'll go into it in our, in our last class, the module three, when we go into time and how it correlates to investment returns. Uh, we talked a little bit about the regal and regulatory factors. Some nice reading, and I'm gonna go through all of them. So if you notice, I'm focusing on the slides that 
and I truly matter in, in context of where I see your risk management aptitude. So this is very nice, healthy reading. You probably design a question from that. And I will break there to see if you have any questions because I want to take a few minutes to go through the case study before we leave. Any questions so far? Um, Mr. Williams, this uh, presentation that you will giving uh is this in the manual yes it is okay thank you no problem anyone else good to go no questions right now um so to digest some more of this and sure i'll have some questions next class okay All right, so let's go through the case study. So we'll take about 15 minutes to go through this case study. Um, to everybody read it. Um, it's, it's a very long. I read. Oh, I read. <laughs> I read some of it. I haven't completed it as yet. All right, Mr. Williams, you're sharing your screen. It's interesting. I am aware. <laughs> I know we love to. We love to in the Bahamas. We love to pay attention to things that have no business for us looking at, but that's okay. You're lecturing the class, you're paying attention, but okay. <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. I just wanted to see. Oh, so as I was saying, sorry, I, um, it's a lot to read. It's a lot mm -hmm. to read. So um, what I did was I tried to, I tried to get in a, a Go ahead. Get a perspective and an approach to the case study. Okay. Um, and to, you know, to what is actually being asked of this 2000 word report that I have to prepare, that we all have to prepare. Um, and so I kind of, um, I kind of have a, a good idea of what I want to do and the approach I want to take. And I believe I have identified um, some risk that I would focus on, but I am needing, so while we're here, I'm glad we're here, I'm needing some clarity and I guess more guidance and perspective on how to approach 1A. And that would be the main components of management priority because I, I have an approach um, and perhaps I guess when you go through it, uh, maybe you might clear it up for me, but I just, I just wanted some perspective on, like I said, the main components of the management priority, because I, like I said, I have, I have an approach that I want to take and it would be environmental and social, also economic from reading, um, from reading a couple of pages in the very beginning. But as I move down in there and I'm realizing that I'm having to build on that, I just want um, some perspective. Thank you. Okay, so let's slow walk this. Firstly, did everyone read the case study? I still have a good way to go. It's 124 pages, right? Yes, yeah, I have a good place to go too. Yeah. 
Okay. Did anyone attempt the questions? I have not. A, a question that I had, um, I wasn't sure if I was misunderstanding the question. It said to review the documents. So I was wondering whether I was missing something else apart from the that one document on the RT annual report. No, everything is there. Everything is in that one RT annual report, right? Yes. Okay, thanks. So let's go through it, guys. So first question, review the documents and prioritize the main risk. What are the main components of the risk management priority? Did you see the word risk in there? Are you, what are, are you? The, what are the main components of the management priority? Apologies. So that, here we are, as I, as I was saying earlier, um, I just wanted to have perspective around um, this components word and how it's being used here. So we're so we're getting so we're so so Roberts we're getting to that. Sorry. Um, I'd like to hear from the other participants. Um, this is your assignment, and we are not going to walk through every single component of this. And so, firstly, what is the type of company of Rio Tinto? Mining company. It's a mining company. It's a mining mining company. metals and aluminum yeah. and steel and all that stuff. It's located. Well, this particular one is located uh, in Australia. And it's a very um what is the word? It's very infant. And um, so yeah, if you would give us some perspective, it would be nice. So for those individuals who have a quite a bit to go, um, please share your perspective on what you've read thus far. Well, um, from what, what I read. Oh, you could go. Yeah, from what I read, it is a mining company that um, uh, it's involved in mining ore, and it's an international company that um, uh, one entity of the company is in Australia, and then they had caused some damages to um, uh, the the some cave or something like that they caused some damages too, and they wanted to become now a more a company that is more in tune with the indigenous people and um, uh, the government of the country, and they want to present they want to present themselves as the uh, company that is that is caring. And um, from what I'm gathering is that because of that mistake that they made right now, they're trying to correct that problem so that that problem does not occur again. What I read so far. Okay. Would anybody else like to add to that? For me, what I had gathered when I read, um, I haven't done much reading, um, but I'm on vacation now and I will be reading more. But what I gathered was that um, they're paying quite a bit of attention to ESG risk. Um, and the whole thrust towards responsible banking. So it, it seems like they're making um, this annual report highly get towards um, showcasing how they, they plan on addressing these key areas and um, 
this direction in which banking and regulation was moving, has been moving. So, so when we think about question one, what comes to mind? Well, I think about what is important to management. Now that could be out of this report, this is a 2020 report. And like Orlando would have shared, you know, they would have um, had a disruption with the rock shelters in the, the Putu County kind of area. Um, and like, like he also shared, they, um, they're trying to, management is actually right now trying to remedy and rebuild their relationships with the stakeholders and with the, with the cultural um, people there for that jungle group of people. Um, and so again, when we read the question, it says what are the main components of the management priority? And when we're thinking about this particular report of 2020, um, it, it is it um, in relation to, again, this whole incident of the breach of their values or are we thinking about them as a whole? And that's that's my point. I'm just trying to get to a point of a position. And so here I am asking you the question. So when we think of A, I think of what is priority to management at this time. Of so their let's talk about it. What is priority to management? Well, at this time of, the, of their report, they're saying that they are committed to um, their employees, they're committed to having integrity, they're committed to service excellence, um, and all of that in their values. And also, again, because of this, this cultural situation, this is also a priority for them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't read the whole, whole thing, so I might be missing some key components, but it seems as if they're in need of repairing their um, reputation in the market and also their reputation with the Indigenous um, people due to the mishap that they had um, um, with the tragedy of Junk and George. And they're issuing out now a lot of new policies and procedures and also some remedies to um, alleviate any misconceptions that persons may have of the company and, with, and how the company conducts business. So one of the things that's going to give you firstly some perspective is if you read the chairman's statement. Yes, that, is, that was why in reading the chairman's statement, that's why I um, made the, the, the form the conclusion um, in terms of the high focus on ESG risk and responsible banking and basically what they're doing towards addressing ESG risk and being more open in that regard. Then on page 10, they actually lay out the breaches, right? And what they have done to uh, support or remediation of some of the challenges that they've incurred in the normal course of business, right? So one of the things that they are seeking to do is restore confidence and trust in their business. They also have a lot of other operational risk concerns in the management of their business. So the CEO lays out some critical foundation here. And so your question one really should drive context in some of the preamble of the financial statement. I think we've all seen financial statements before. 
there's a lot of statements, there's a lot of communication, a stakeholder engagement that happens. And so those drive the priority. And then B, what is your view of the risk? Is the risk moving in a positive direction? Have we firstly identified the risk? We mentioned operational risk, strategic risk, perhaps maybe sovereign risk. Okay, thank you. I, I think I was heading in the right direction. Thank you. So you want to be able to identify those key risks. If there's a loss of shareholder confidence, stakeholder confidence, we know that it's going to cause a depreciation in your overall balance sheet. We just talked about business models. Right? And they have five components. And you want to think perhaps a priority of management would be about how they want to strategically reposition themselves within this environment how they want to support rebranding and adequately cement consumer confidence. Are they demonstrating their, their core values, their mission statements? Did they conduct feasibility assessments to truly understand their operational vulnerabilities? How did they address the breaches that occurred? We see here, the integrity of our business and supply chain, right? So this is a value chain analysis. Safety, teamwork, respect, integrity, excellence. So this is a global company and how they manage that. When you go on to page, I think it's a hundred. Um, so it's in its five years. So you'll see if you utilize some of the financial ratios, you'll see some of the performance results. And if you use a, a trend analysis or variance, you'll see within the report, it actually talks about the forward-looking perspectives. We want to consider value over volume. So how does their forward-looking approaches align with their business model? How much will it cause a reshift of their business model? When we think about people processing systems, we think about Training, integration, design, fitness and probability of resources, effectiveness of scale, cost to serve. So it goes into key performance indicators, continuing. And that's some healthy reading. 
but you have to read it, right? If we take it down all the way to I'll tell you now. The risk management report. I would encourage you for those that have not read it. Start here. Let's not do the typical thing that we do in our culture, which is wait for the last minute and then scramble around to produce a report, right? Let's, let's try every week to advance with the reading, with our capture of the information. And let's progress with a sound report. So this looks like page 92. So after you read the preamble from your C-suite, go, go to page 92 and toggle between the report so that it gives you some perspective. If you read it page by page, it may not be very healthy or comfortable reading, especially if you're not one who is accustomed to this type of report. And information just jumps right out at you. So they talk about the emerging risks, what assurances and the analysis and the oversight that they're looking at getting into. But what really stood out to me, and, and this is the first time I'm seeing this assignment, what's really stood out to me is the, this page right here, 95. And I was, so question one, B is on page 95. So it's saying here, current assessment of principal risk. So we have our principal risk. We have the core risk groupings, whether they're economic, operational, ESG. And then you give your view of the risk impacting the business. And this has an impact analysis which is low, very low, moderate, high, very high. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. So, so then you have the you have the risk, and then you have the corresponding business impact. Right. So it's possible, very likely, but the impact is moderate. It's a very high impact, but it's unlikely. What is your view? What are the main sources of question two? What are the main sources of revenue? And how do the risk you identify potentially affect revenue? We know to go to the balance sheet and income statement, but you have your financial ratios. You have a lot of information in front of you. So you just want to be able to at least jot down some of your draft points. And even here on page at the bottom of 95, right? They have a definition of the risk groups. You, you don't have to do much. Question three, outline the general philosophy in respect of the hedging of their currency interest and commodity exposure. What is their philosophy? Right? And for those that, that don't, um, that haven't, like I said, done this in a while, um, you know, 
Just search the word. Hedge. And, and, and you know what? The information comes out. And then you give your views. So I will stop here because you have not read. You have not read the information. You have not read the questions and you have not prepared yourself for this discussion. I mentioned it last class and so I will say it again. So we've lost a week, right? We have material to get through. And I wanna ensure that I assist you with this process, but you have to do your part, right? So you have 2,000 votes to write. And for those that have not written a paper in a while, you got to get cracking. So you really have all three perspectives already covered, right? So same way you type hedge, you type currency. You say I've 12 times, right? And you want, you want to get a perspective on interest. So what I, what I want you to, what I would encourage you to do is utilize your WhatsApp group for the next few days to really go through in detail, right? If you would like, break up the questions into group. This is your group. This is your WhatsApp group, right? Assign it to certain individuals and you guys come together and then decide on the ultimate approach. No, of course not. Not everyone's paper will be the same, but you want to be able to know where to, where to get information, how to interpret it, how to align interest and approach, and then you commence the writing of your paper. You may want to do it in groups of two, you may want to do it in groups of three, but you want to come together and you want to utilize your, the fundamentals of your group to assist you with the assignment. And then when we come back to, into our next session, I want us to focus on more multiple choice and actually going through the assignment. We'll touch on the material as we go along but I have to meet you where you are, right? So I will pause there. I think that's been some very helpful context to the assignment thus far. I believe everyone has the assignment and we have the questions. So let's, let's stage progress it. And again, 15, 20 minutes a day. Let's just see what we can produce. By next week, Wednesday, we should have a healthy document to discuss. Because I'd like for it, I would like for us to discuss it. Right. So, any questions so far? None from me. I would like to know one thing: How soon could this um, uh, session be updated or uh, put on on YouTube? So I can watch it again because this is really interesting. Uh, I think I learned a lot and I want to go over it again as soon as possible. Um, 
I think Miguel could do it as soon as tomorrow, but I imagine because the session is recorded. Um, so I could send him a note and ask him to, re uh, to send it out to you guys. I don't think that's an issue. Yeah, I would really appreciate it because the last one that came up today, and you know, man, was very interesting. I like your approach and I really like the way you're doing. You are lecturing us on this, on this subject. Yeah, not a problem. I'm, I'm here to help. But I, I, I want us to, I actually want us to remember our theme is next level, right? In order for us to get to next level, we have to address some baseline components. And at a minimum, that's, that's just you reading, right? So let's read, let's document. We have one more session for module three. And if you notice, I am actually giving you context before I go through the slides. So the slides is actually the reinforcement of context that I would have previously shared. We will go through some more multiple choice and then we will end next session going through the assignment so that we can have really some clear direction on how, whether it be by individual or group approach, because this is what you're going to experience in the work environment. You're going to experience uh, receiving assignments that maybe you may be uncomfortable with, and, and that's okay. Uh, but you're going to have these very same individuals who are in your group today that you will be able to call that is talking about where there's changes with Securities Commission, the Central Bank, what's happening globally. And because you're being requested as the risk management professional or whichever aspect of your current professional discipline, to speak on what are the potential impacts to your institution. And whether it's a report, you're actually able to have an engaging discussion just on the matters, right? So I think this is a good time for us to bring salutation. This was a great session, guys. Uh, let's keep the momentum up. And let's continue to be next level. I remain available if you have any questions by email. Uh, continue. I like the work that you've been doing with your WhatsApp group. I thought the PayPal reference and the national risk assessment, kudos to Candice and Jessica. I understand Darcy is the one who assisted with setting it up. So great work, guys. And just continue to remain positive. I know sometimes it will seem a bit challenging, particularly having worked all day and week. But believe me, if you do a little reading 10, 15 minutes a day, you will spread out the weight and work it in teams. Believe me, it works. And you only have to do this for the next few months. You got three, module three, module four, module five, module six. So we're talking June, July, August. We're done, we're done. August, September, we're done. And if there's, uh, uh, depending on the circumstances, I could design a, a study session or a review session for you, where we can go over every module, we could design some questions for every module, so we can answer some of the challenging components of the module. But let's address our low hanging fruit, which is today. June 8th is when this assignment needs to be completed. So 
Let's walk Bye. away. Let's let's walk away. Let's do what we gotta do, guys. You do your part, I do mine. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, guys. So have a good one. Pleasantries to the evening. Thank and you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Have a good one.